Hello, my sweet summer children. I'm back with another episode of Overwatch. I have my friend with me, Gemma. Gemma, would you like to tell the people what's up? Hi, everybody. Yeah, I'm Gemma. Thank you for having me on. Do you know what? That was far too happy. I feel that we need a somber mood for this episode, really. So I'm, I'm going to pull it down a notch, but thank you for having me on, Grace. <laughs> <laughs> so in the beginning of the episode, Ned has already been put in the dungeons and Varys comes to visit him. And Ned asks Varys, like, what does he want? Who does he serve? And Varys says that he serves the realm. Do you believe him? Oh, goodness me. Who knows what Varys wants, right? Um, the scene in, and I'm jumping forward several seasons here immediately, um, but the scene where he meets Danny. Um, in season seven and he he goes through a variety of different avenues to try and win her over he says that she's beautiful and then he tries to say that um, he didn't know anything about her and, he, and, and and none of them work and eventually he finds the right tract and then he, he he senses that that's that's the where to go and he goes for it he does the same here with Ned and that's what that season seven scene with Danny reminded me of back to this scene here in the in the black cells um he, he kind of tries all these different roots doesn't he? he tries to appeal to ned's honor and his duty and and eventually he knit he hits the nail on the head when he talks about sansa and either he sees something in ned or the response he recognizes ah there it is that that's the weakness this is my in this is the avenue i need to follow and so various is actually quite manipulative towards ned but ultimately kind of feels that he does sort of have Ned's interests here. I mean, we said we weren't going to skip to the end, but Varys does something that we will discuss at the very end of this episode that that is very telling of his motivations here, right? Yeah, yeah, very telling. And I honestly do not trust Varys. I, I, I'm going to have to go to the books for this. I feel like um, when Varys killed Kevin Lannister, it really showed his hand, like everything that he said to Kevin about um, why he was killing him. Like, yes. I'm not going to let you mend all of these uh, relationships that Cersei has messed up. I'm going to let to the Tyrells blame Cersei and I'm going to let Cersei blame the Tyrells. Like, you're no better than Littlefinger. Like, what you're describing is basically a ladder of chaos for Aegon. And I think at that time, I think Varys thought that with Robert out of the picture, Ned would be an ally for Aegon. Even um, even if that was a temporary thing, right? Even if he yeah. just used him as, so long as he served his purpose. I think Varys certainly had plans for Ned. So maybe his... Um, motivations for wanting to keep Ned alive weren't necessarily altruistic, let's say. I um, absolutely agree with you on that. I think I think you're right. Ultimately, I think Varys thought that Ned could serve a very significant purpose for his ultimate plans with Aegon. Well, not in the show, obviously, but yeah, um, it's a shame they dropped that, but I can kind of see why they didn't go that way. It would have got very complicated very fast, <laughs> it? even more yeah. so. <laughs> yeah. So it, in the books, when Ned is in the the dungeons, he has uh, fever dreams or dungeon dungeon dreams, I guess. Dungeon and, dreams. <laughs> dun, dungeon <laughs> dreams. And um, we get some Liana stuff. I wish we would have got like some of that in the show, but I think it was too early and it would have probably confuse people but like the rlj hype was being sown like way back in oh absolutely yeah way back in, in those early books yeah definitely um i was fully expecting a flashback because i obviously like you said i book reader first um so i knew what was coming so i was very keenly aware that this was the last opportunity um, because I didn't know how else they could go around this. They did figure out another way in, in season six. But I, I, I'm thinking this this is the last chance. If Ned doesn't have a flashback now, we're not going to get one. And I remember in season six when I, 
first first saw that opening tarot of joy i literally jumped out out of my sofa and squealed because i <laughs> real oh, they are doing it finally <laughs> because i was sorely disappointed um when he was laid recovering from his wound and robert gave him the hand of the kingpin back and then on this occasion as well and there was no flashback for either of those two situations uh yeah i was very disappointed um and i was thinking how are they going to foreshadow because i was already an r plus l equals j before the start show began um because of my book knowledge i, I was thinking how are they going to do this how are they going to foreshadow it how are they going to get this information across you know yeah so, yeah disappointed i'm hoping maybe possibly we get a tourney of heron hall flashback in season eight uh yeah even if my... it's just to kind of go along the night of the laughing tree angle and just give us a brief the briefest glimpse into that that would be wonderful yeah it doesn't have to take too long does it no 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 <laughs> absolutely not so moving on at the twins, we're in the Riverlands now, and at the twins, Theon is outside and he's like killing the ravens. He's shooting them down. Which he's I wonder, I wonder. Fucking like, world of phrase emails, isn't he? <laughs> yes, <laughs> uh, that is exactly what he's doing. I like. I wonder if that's like kind of foreshadowing a little bit that you know he's gonna try to kill the three-eyed raven, which he tried to kill Bran. But Bran escaped, and poor these poor ravens didn't escape. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I think that's a hundred percent what it was. I think it was foreshadowing of Theon's betrayal in general to House Stark, but specifically through Bran, with it being the Raven that he shot down. Um, it was rather hilarious that the the message that they'd intercepted was actually completely innocuous and, and not nefarious in any way. Shape, or form. <laughs> yeah, it was like a birthday message to yeah, his granddaughter yeah. or something. So they need to cross the trident. Yeah. It's, it's the trident they want to cross, right? And um, yes. Uh, I think it, is it the green fork? I think it's specifically the green fork of the trident that the twins go across. But correct, I'm sure I will be corrected if I'm wrong. But yeah, off the top of my head, that's that's the one I'm going for. It will. It'll be in the comments if we're wrong. It will. But I think <laughs> I think it's the green fork. But um, yeah. So Rob needs to pass the trial. He needs to pass. Like going around, I guess, would take too long. He's in a hurry, and Catelyn goes to talk to Walder Frey. And yes. <laughs> oh my god he's so disgusting he yeah. is a disgusting man and you get you you could tell he's disgusting before he does any of the stuff that he does in season three absolutely i mean i mean we would hit over the head with foreshadowing that this is not a man to be trusted walder frey always reminded me of um like a troll and i don't mean like an internet troll i mean like the traditional fairy tale troll you know exacting his tolls to cross his bridge yeah that yeah. kind of vibe but you're right david bradley wow he just he just does such an excellent job of portraying world Frey of this distasteful disgusting lecherous when he kisses cat's hand and she's like <laughs> yeah she wanted to she wanted to throw like i was just wondering like how did dan and dave or whoever does the casting like find so many people that look alike like with like they all look related yeah and, yeah you're right yeah like they they really all look related except for the one that Ed Tully winds up marrying. She doesn't look related to them. <laughs> but um, so I would think that you already know that he's not to be trusted because of the way like I think it's Rob or Theon says, Well, this is your father's bannerman, like why can't we trust him? Why won't he let us through? Like if he's your bannerman then he should just let us through. Sure, he should, yeah. But he doesn't. No. And he kind of says why. And he says his reasonings for why he's not going to let them through to Catelyn. And it's basically like, your father has always looked down on me. You Starks and you Tullys, you look down on me. Like, you don't want to marry any of my daughters. You don't want to marry any of my sons. Like, he's trying to get rid of children. 
He says um, Stark, Tully, Lannister, Baratheon. I think that's the right order. Um, give me one good reason why I should waste a single thought on any of you. And that's very reminiscent of season five. Danny's um, breaking the wheel speech, isn't yes. it? Yes, 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 very. Do you feel like because he's a lesser house that he feels like those Baratheon, Lannister, Starks, Tully, all of them are taking advantage of all the smaller houses? Or is he just a shit ass man? Like, because I think he's just a shit man. Yeah, I, th I think so, too. I think um, House Frey has always they're, they're a very young house, uh, comparatively speaking. I think it's about 600 years old, which sounds forever in our terms. But in Westerosi terms, when you're talking about 8000 years plus of Stark Kings of Winter, you know, that they're, they're, they're just the children of the group and they're kind of looked down on and and they're not really taken too seriously. So I think he's reaching. I think he's punching above his weight. I mean, to be fair, I think while we can say that Rob Stark was deluded for the decisions that he made, making this agreement and then backing out of it and assuming Walder Frey would be cool with that. I think Walder Frey in this in this moment is being quite deluded to think that the Starks are ever going to have children with his offspring. Oh I mean, my God. Really? I mean, no, that that nobody really takes the phrase very seriously, do they, within Westeros? But no. I mean, Walder Frey makes it very clear. Literally, the, the pretty much one of the first things he says to Catelyn um, is he suggests handing them over to the Lannisters right there. He literally says the words. Yeah. And then he makes it, and then he makes it like, oh, your father, because your father didn't come to my wedding. <laughs> he didn't yeah, say yeah. that, but he's like, um, she's like, I heard you got a new wife. Yeah, your father didn't come to the wedding. Couldn't be he's bothered. Like, <laughs> he's like that, that bitter kid at school that just hates everybody because he's not allowed in the cool gang. Yeah. Yeah. That, that's kind of how, you know, he feels, he clearly feels ostracized and he's clearly bitter and resentful about that. Um, I think even if Rob had agreed and and not negate 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 negged gone back on his plan <laughs> uh, on the deal um that Walder would have handed them over anyway his price was ridiculous it was i his mean i know and one thing a lot of people forget that is that it wasn't just rob was it there was a, a pact made between aria and right. one of, as well and that that sort of well, I think that's quite ironic when you consider how that came about in the show and who ultimately did did the phrase. Okay. Um, but yeah, yeah. So that's an interesting circle, isn't it? Yeah. So it, it was Arya had to marry one of his sons. Rob had to marry one of his daughters. They had to take Little Walder and Big Walder as fosters um, or wards in Winterfell. Um, and there was a squire. squire, one of them was a squire, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, it was like so much, like just across your little just petty ass the... bridge. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But, but this is why he's the troll, isn't he? I mean, the, the price is, it's like um, the faceless men, isn't it? The price depends on who's paying yeah. and what, what they potentially have to offer. And the Starks have a lot to offer House Frey. And Rob was desperate. Yes, and Walder knew it. And he took advantage because yes, Rob accepted and Rob crossed. And I that, love that scene. Which which one? Of them, um, of all the northern, like the caravan of northern horses with the Stark banners just going through the bridge, like, or yeah. going around. I actually thought when Theon laughed at Rob because he had to marry one of the friends, <laughs> which was quite hilarious. Yeah, that was. <laughs> That just that hilarious. kind of because they were kind of still bros at that time weren't they and it was just that that nudge and smirk kind of thing that you do to to one of your mates so you know that that was quite endearing yeah <laughs> so at the wall john gets long claw and <laughs> yeah i'm just like i know that john saved your mormont from the white but I don't know. Is am I just crazy that I think it's too much to give him Valerian steel for that? 
it does I, I i'm completely with you i mean yeah we you know john is now synonymous with long claw and it's, it's a big deal and geo is in exile and he let his family down and bloody blah, blah 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 but this is valerian steel and not just valerian steel it's a family heirloom that's yeah. gone through hundreds of years perhaps even more of mormont you know could he not have given it to one of the girls or if he was really set on giving it to a son wait until one was born <laughs> yeah. i mean you know yeah it, it did seem like a very excessive gift i mean and even john snow points this out doesn't he kind of like, says, hey, yeah, God, yeah, mate, well, this like is i can't really take expensive. this <laughs> yeah and and geo's Gio, just like hey just just take it no fancy business no talking and, just take it yeah the i don't want to talk about it, it. Yeah, Take it. Much. We don't have to speak about it. Yeah. I just found it odd. Like when I was watching it back, I've never really looked too much into it. I just took it as one of those things like, okay, well, John had to get Valerian Steel some kind of way. So I guess this is the way. Yeah. But then I'm like, okay, well, George is like so meticulous. And this just seems like so extra. So <laughs> <laughs> this just seems like, okay. One thing I found very interesting about the scenes in this episode um, at the wall is that John isn't wearing black of the Night's Watch yet. Whereas all of the other, because John has taken his vows, he already yeah. did that in a previous episode and all the others that went with him um, and Sam, that took their vows at the same time, they are now all in this episode wearing black. The only character that has taken his vows that is not wearing black is John. And I feel that this is kind of indicative of the fact that he does actually have essentially one last test because, and this this is what happens with Amon and then his brothers bring him back. Um, and that that's, we're kind of skipping ahead a little bit, but it's not until that final scene where John leaves the wall to venture into the north that he wears he's wearing full black from top to tail for the first time. And, and I did find that a very interesting detail and, and choice that they made to kind of show that he's not 100% in the crew yet, not mentally. I've watched that a thousand times and never noticed that. <laughs> <laughs> so when John gets this sword, right? Yeah, everyone wants to see it, and he's showing them his sword. He lets them play around with it, and then Sam winds up telling John, yes. although he's not supposed to, he winds up telling John about Rob. And this is and his final test, isn't it? Yeah, this is his final test, and it. John says that he should be there. So yeah, John winds up meeting with Mister Amon and. This is my favorite scene in the whole entire season one. Mm -hmm. This is my favorite scene. And it's just because I still get chills when I watch it. Like, there, well, there's a lot of scenes that I still get chills when I watch it. But this one, it's like, I don't know. It's like the speech, isn't it? The, yeah. The kill the boy speech. This is, this is the, and the reveal as well. Wow. No, it, I don't think this is it the kill the boy speech. It's the honor it, death it death honor is the death love is the death of honor or duty honored love death all of that. <laughs> and that he, yeah, he's like right. he says um I know how you feel. Oh, it hurts, boy, doesn't it? And mm -hmm. <laughs> and like John's helping him feed the ravens and he's like John was like you don't know how I feel. And then he tells him like my brother and he talks about uh, Rhaegar's children and it's just so eerie because he's talking to Rhaegar's son yeah yeah so it, it gives us a lot of backstory and John and Aemon's relationship seems to grow from there and they become really close in my opinion and also I almost feel like Aemon was telling John not to make the same mistake he did and go to his family. Like, I almost feel like he was trying to encourage him to do that. And thematically, this ties in very, very neatly with Ned and what goes on with Ned in this episode, doesn't it? Yes. Um, I, I, I had a little bit of a gripe with this particular scene uh, as a book wanker. Sorry, as a book. I, I, what's another word? <laughs> 
as a self-declared book snob, um, <laughs> and I don't mind saying that. I was confused by lineages. Um, uh, you probably know where I'm going with this. Um, I, I do my whole family tree and everything. I'm very, very fascinated by family trees just in general. And I've created a, a huge Song of Ice and Fire one. I've, I'm up to about 900 characters that are all linked to Aegon the Conqueror in some way. Um, and Wow, how does he say it? I, I did write some notes for this one. Here we go. Mesa Amon says that his father was King Makar Targaryen, who was followed by Amon's brother Aegon, which is Egg, um, who was then followed by Ares the Mad King Targaryen. Uh, he's completely omitted Jaehaerys, um, Aegon's second son. Ah. Uh. And and that I, I just it just it just threw me a little bit. I mean, I'm not sure if this was an oversight or or if the producers, you know, made a conscious decision and and just thought it added an unnecessary layer of dialogue about Targaryen heritage. I mean, I know it's complicated at best, but I, I would argue that an, an one additional name in that instance wouldn't have made any difference to show only watchers, but it was something that book readers might have been a little bit thrown by, because you know, missing out an entire Targaryen king, I, I think that's a pretty big deal. But the, the speech itself was beautiful. Uh, I loved Jon's petulance and his sullenness and his broodiness and, and the fact that he's just acting like a bit of a mardy child. And then Aemon kind of just puts him straight in his place, you know? Yeah, yeah. And, and it's wonderfully done. And there's that moment because obviously Aemon's blind. And there's a moment where it looks like Amon is literally staring into John's soul. And then when John moves his head up and meets Amon's eyes, he's kind of taken aback momentarily. And then Amon kind of goes back into his, oh, yes, I'm blind mode. <laughs> yeah. And it's like, what just happened there? <laughs> yes. I did, like that scene is everything. And it's so much that builds up after it and it's just like the irony of that scene is just crazy like especially like fast forward when you think about how Eamon died and oh, yeah. how he felt like he needed to go to Daenerys and help her like in the books he felt like he needed to go to Daenerys and help her and all this stuff but really you were helping your other like you were helping your other family member and you didn't even know it and he didn't even know it so I just really love how that scene plays out. Yeah, it, it was it was fabulous. And of course, you've got the connection with the Ravens and what have you, which is a nice little nod, I think, to Mormont's Raven, who didn't feature in the show. But oh, I my think God. We sort of, oh, can you imagine how irritating that would have been? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Con, con, con. No, thank you. I'm Snow. done. I'm out. Snow. <laughs> <laughs> but they did include things like that you know obviously sam has a lot to do with the ravens beyond the wall and what have you as well so it's kind of the the, the feels the presence of a raven does feel part of the beyond the wall and at the wall kind of stuff so it's 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 there yes so uh across the narrow sea daenerys is riding with the drogo and drogo is sick and he falls from his horse and the calls say a call or the blood the the blood ride the Dothraki say a call who can't ride is no call. So yeah. Daenerys is kind of like you know make camp here, and they're like it's nowhere to make camp. And she's like do what I say. I'm your Khaleesi, and uh, they're basically like you're only the Khaleesi while the blood of my blood lives. And Drogo is dying. Yeah, I think I don't think you had to be a book reader at that point to understand at that moment in the show that the second Drogo fell off his horse, he was done. Yeah. Um, not just, I mean, his life ultimately, but but the respect from the Dothraki because we we did have a, um, a glean into the culture of the Dothraki in the show, and and I think what you just said about not being able to ride a horse, um, that that was very definitely. Um, brought across to the audience. Yeah. I I, I was kind of wondering, like, would the Dothraki flip on Daenerys? Like, if Daenerys started taking 
a lot of L's, <laughs> like if she started <laughs> losing, if she didn't have her mount anymore, like if she got pregnant, like and she couldn't ride anymore, like is she still a call? I don't know. Those are questions for another day. Yeah. yeah. But I feel there is a lovely hint when she's having that argument where she says, no, we'll camp here. Everything's fine. I'm in complete and utter denial. Everything's going to be wonderful and butterflies and roses. Um, she's told, um, she says, you know, she defiantly says, I am the blood of the dragon. And she's told the dragons are all dead. Beautiful for ironic foreshadowing for the next episode, isn't that? Whew. I love it. Because the next episode you guys know what happened if you saw yes. fire and blood um but so miri Mazdor basically daenerys is not gonna accept that call drogo is gonna die and she's gonna bring him back and the way that she's gonna do that is with blood magic and miri Mazdor says only death can pay for life and bring him bring her so khaleesi was like my death and she's like no not your death khaleesi bring me his horse so i'm thinking at this time when i'm watching this that that means though okay the horse's life is gonna pay for drogo's life i mean Mary Mazdor does insinuate that the horse will be enough doesn't she she's she quite does. sneaky though because her eyes do linger on danny's pregnant stomach i mean certainly long enough for us to take note yeah. But yeah, she's she's being a bit sneaky here, I think I feel. So then she says not to come in the tent. The dead will dance here tonight. And it seems like they're kind of I don't know, like the shadows on the tent are, and there's like all these roaring noises coming out of there and like uh, when Drogo's blood rider like comes up on there He's like, no, 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 you cannot do this. What are you doing? Yeah. Like, th that is like forbidden things that she is doing. Like, Daenerys, the tales of Daenerys amongst the Dothraki have to be insane, like Bloodstone Emperor level insane. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, and this this is what you you were saying. They they do the Dothraki do not approve of blood magic, and they do they don't tolerate what she's done here, um, as we will see um, when she does emerge from the tent. Ultimately, the majority, the vast majority, have abandoned her, and this wasn't because Drogo could no longer ride. This is because what she's doing here, this blood magic. Yeah, so. Jorah winds up proving his skills and Daenerys is in labor. Oh my God. <laughs> is that your cat? Yes. <laughs> I mean, it's not as if Miri Mazdor, it's like uh, a lot has been read into this. You know, did Miri Mazdor know? Was this an intentional setup? Did she plan this from the beginning? Um, I think Miri Mazdor to an extent was a, an opportunist. Yeah. Um, but she did give her an out when danny's saying you know this this will not bear that um he can't die i'll do anything um i'll pay the price um miri mazdor tells her over and over again that no good can come from this she literally just like walder frey repeatedly explains i he, he might as well say i cannot be trusted by the way and miri mazdor is kind of saying the same thing this is not a good idea danny don't do it but yeah. danny persists and miri mazdor is kind of like okay then if you say so yeah there's no no way danny can claim that she was manipulated even though she, she kind of was um, because she demanded this of Miramar's door, didn't she? Yeah, she was desperate. And D Drogo, Drogo was her first love, and she was in love with him, and she was pregnant with his child. So to lose him was basically to lose everything. Like Jor was saying, your son will be ripped from your stomach anyway. Yeah. he And, and they would have killed 
her they would have killed her and her baby anyway yeah so, i think i think you're right i don't think it was just um because she loved him i think a lot of people see that that it was pure love and pure desperation through the motivation of love but like you said it was everything um a child would have been murdered she would have probably been murdered she would have certainly have lost the kalasar she would have had no one and nothing um the best case scenario for her would to be left alive and in the middle of nowhere on her own which is kind of what happened <laughs> yeah <laughs> definitely but you know um it, this brings me um to like season eight when we're talking about the betrayal for love uh-huh. um a lot of people have hinted at i've even thought about possibly Daenerys bringing john back uh, like like how John was brought, John specifically says he doesn't want to be brought back. But would Daenerys bring him back, or has Daenerys learned her lesson not to play with death, like not to interfere with that because of what happened with Drogo? It's interesting, isn't it? Because when Danny um, realized that when people were talking about John getting stabbed in the heart, that they weren't being metaphorical when she saw him all topless um <laughs> and she noticed the the, the wounds um yeah. you know that surely there must have been a part of her that her mind crossed back to drogo who couldn't be saved yeah and and john who has been saved and and you know what was the difference between this magic so there may have been a very long period after drogo where she was very skeptical about said blood magic but then upon seeing john um, there doesn't appear to be any moment where John's really sat down with Danny and had a good chat about his resurrection and, and what he went through emotionally and mentally as a result of that. Um, so maybe that will reignite a part of her that thinks, oh, well, it worked here. It was just, Drogo was just an, an anomaly, just, just a mis- un- unfortunate situation. As a general rule, Beric came back, John came back, you know, these guys are fine. So yeah, maybe that will turn her opinion, perhaps. Maybe, which would be sad. I wonder if that will be the actual betrayal for love. But I won't stay on that too long because <laughs> we could I go on for be, days. I think it would be interesting, and, and I'll shut up after this, I promise. Um, if the betrayal for love was Danny's betrayal yeah and it would be a betrayal because he doesn't want to be brought back yeah right. and if she does it anyway but we could get really heavy into this and we've still got more <laughs> of this episode to crack through oh so yes you're right, you're right. yes we'll yes, put the yes. hold on that one another yeah. video perhaps yeah another video and me and Gem are going to be talking about some viserion juice here soon so yeah yeah we are i'm looking forward to that yeah absolutely <laughs> In the Lannister camp, Tyrion is at dinner with his family, kind of. <laughs> They're, mm-hmm. like, having war council. and Talk about your awkward family dinners. Right? Yeah, <laughs> definitely. And Tywin puts Tyrion in the vanguard. And Tyrion's mm-hmm. like, you know what? There's better ways to have me killed. <laughs> it's just... So Tyrion, like, he's not hungry anymore. He leaves. And this is where he meets Shay. Um, Brown Can I just or... talk about that scene just quickly oh, before sure. we get on to Shay? Um, oh, oh, like you said, Tyrion's horrified because essentially his father's saying, I'm willing to risk your life in this upcoming battle, which is like, wow, harsh. Um, and that's that's why Tyrion's so upset because his, his dad's literally staking his life on this, um, putting him in harm's way. But in the books, this is played out quite differently. Um, Tyrion isn't disgusted or horrified. Tyrion's actually delighted in the books that Tywin's d- uh, made this choice because he believes that Tywin is finally giving him like the honor that he deserves. Mm-hmm. But it's actually during the battle, which obviously doesn't because he's unconscious in the show, but in the books, he actually participates in the battle and quite effectively, actually, it has to be said. Um, But it's literally during the battle, as he's watching what's going on around him, that Tyrion realizes that his father tricked him. And, And I think it's important because this, in the books at least, established that despite all his wit and wisdom, the one person that can put the blinders on Tyrion, that can pull the wool over his eyes, appears to be his father. 
and that's huge so i wonder i mean they changed a lot about Tyrion at this point didn't they actually yeah well see i definitely think Tyrion is tywin's son oh yeah. i think i think Tyrion gets the cleverness he gets all of that knowledge and big brain and clever moves and all of that witty i think he gets that from tywin absolutely so yeah. of course tywin's gonna be better at him than playing at, at playing these games but he has a different tune in the next episode he sure does yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah this is the first time we meet shay though isn't it um played by the lovely sibelki kelly who um i actually met in dallas last year and Kyle, oh bless him, he just utterly fell in love. The poor boy. <laughs> poor boy. <laughs> he could barely speak. It was hilarious. Oh my gosh, Kyle. <laughs> so Bron took took her, right? Bron took yeah. Shay from another man's tent. And then Shay and Tyrion make an agreement. And basically the the agreement is like a few different things but the last thing is to basically bang like it's his last night in the world and seems reasonable i i guess i guess that's what you would tell a whore <laughs> <laughs> anyway so later shay Bron, and Tyrion are playing games and we find out that bron has been beyond the wall and this has sparked a lot of theories yeah. Speculation. Is he Tons, a wildling? Yeah. Is he nice? Watch, the watch, yeah. yeah. And they like I think they ask him for what and he's like work. That's right. Yeah, he says work. So I mean that could indicate be anything. Nice watch, but it, yeah, it could be literally anything. I mean, was he a smuggler or the, the, yeah, I mean, uh, that, and that was never answered, was it? We never got um, a resolution to that question. So we, we no. theorized and, and got nothing. <laughs> no yeah. payoff. And we also get the story of Taisha. And <sighs> that is the, that is a sad story. Like, Oh, it's utterly traumatizing. It's almost as traumatizing as the final. No, it's not traumatizing as the final scene. But it, it's up there, right? It's, yeah. Wow. I mean, and, and they dumbed it down in the show. They didn't actually give us the full horror of what Tywin really did. There was a very significant detail missed out of that story in the show, yes. wasn't there? Yes. I know if it, okay. Tyrion, his whole, I would say his whole Dance of Dragons. I, his whole story, the entire story. The where do horses go story. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It, I feel like it's like, that's his arc. Yeah. That, like, that's Tyrion. And in Dance of Dragons, like, it just, you see it more, I don't know, to the forefront. Yeah. But when you, when you look back, you can see, like, a lot of his behavior. You can see where it came from. Yeah, oh. I'm, I wish they hadn't dropped that one. I think as soon as they dropped the Taisha thing in the show, that's when Tyrion's storyline kind of went off the rails a bit. It was like they didn't really know where else to take him. They, they knew where they weren't going to take him. But it kind of felt a bit meandering after a certain point. Um, and, it, and it is strange because the inclusion of this story here in this episode suggests that the original intention was for them to go down this route. See, this is the thing. <laughs> I, I don't want to get too off track here. But <laughs> I also, like, in an earlier episode, when Arya sees Varys and um, Illyrio talking, you think yes. they're going to be, they're going to bring in Aegon. Like, you, yep. that makes you think that they're going to bring in Aegon, and they don't. It's like, something happened... What when did Dance of Dragons come out? Like right after season one aired. It, yeah, yeah. It was I remember sort of watching and reading in tandem. So I'm just thinking like maybe they didn't know how big of a story it was gonna actually get because it gets a <laughs> lot bigger. It gets a yeah. lot bigger in just one book. 
It's like just when you reach a point with these books that you think, well, this is going to start tapering soon because it kind of has to. No, it just blossoms into this even more humongous, complicated network of brambles and thorns. And um, George R. R. Martin called it his mirror and he's not, didn't he? Yes, yes. And I think he's kind of going through like a Miranese knot situation right now at the I wall. I think you might be right. I think you might be right. Uh, this one's this one's been painful for all of us, hasn't it? Yeah. Yeah. So Tywin is thinking, you know, Rob is green. He's a green boy. He can march into the lion's den if he wants. And Rob has actually done something clever, which is divide his army up. And he manages to take Jamie Lannister. And the exchange between Rob and Jamie is priceless. So Jamie is used to having things his way. Everything's his way. And he proposes, and he's used to always being in control of situations. And he proposes, you know, let's do things, let let's me and you cross swords. And you get to see like Rob being like this smart uh i don't want to necessarily say political player because i don't think he was that strong strategist yeah but he's just like you know kingslayer if we do it your way you'll yeah win. we're and not that, that is very much an echo uh, in a very reverse of of roles of the smackdown talk between ramsey and john prior to the battle of the bastards wasn't it yes because obviously it was the good guy in in that scenario that offered the one on one and the <laughs> Ramsey that said near nah, I don't think so mate <laughs> <laughs> yeah so i i was totally loving that but the part that of that scene that i really really like is not only there's two parts so the first part is Catelyn sitting on that um what it was it ridge or whatever mm -hmm. and she's just looking and waiting and waiting and waiting and um Sir Roderick is like my lady like we have to go like we need to go we need to go and she's just like no no and when she sees him she busts out crying yeah. like I felt that and I don't even like her and I just like I, I really love that scene too um Cat's all right. She's not my favorite, but that scene, like you said, it, it was quite beautiful. Um, in the books, she's with Hallis Mullen and not Roderick Cassell. But actually, unlike um, the action of the Green Fork, which we saw Tyrion and he got knocked unconscious and then he woke up and the whole battle was over and they they won apparently. Um, that was very different book to show. But what we saw with Cat from her perspective waiting to find out the fate of her son um it was very very well played and very similar to what happened that's exactly how it was portrayed in the books as well very much from cat's perspective waiting listening every now and again she gets like a glint of steel through the the trees and and she can hear what's going on and and yeah you just get that increasing sense of anxiety and apprehension and, and i think they captured that really beautifully for the show actually yes I love that scene. And I also love Rob's speech afterwards. Like, you know, one victory doesn't make us conquerors. Um, have we freed my father? Have we freed my yeah. sisters? Like, have we freed, like, they want our, the northern, they want the north on our knees. Like, he is cool-headed. Whereas Theon is kind of like, kill him now, Rob. <laughs> kill him. He killed two of our men. Like, you saw him kill him and rob's just like you know i'm gonna be more level-headed about this <laughs> and I, I just like that like i live for that i, I really <laughs> like rob rob is really one of my favorites rob was awesome and and um, richard madden wow he's gorgeous and a phenomenal actor he's been in a lot of other things um a lot of sort of very english only kind of see um series and things and and he's just wonderful um but we both love jamie don't we and this yeah. is the beginning of his arc isn't it but i yeah. did like um the first thing he said to cat um is that he would offer her his sword but he seems to have lost it and eventually <laughs> 
he's going to lose his sword hand, but he will gain a sword, he will get a new sword, and it will be a sword made from Kat's husband's own that he's about to lose something quite significant with. Right? <laughs> so it's all... I'm, I'm trying not to give it away, which is ridiculous. <laughs> but we're, we're here. here. <laughs> we're here. We're here. We're here. We're at the we're at the point. We're at the point. So Arya is chasing pigeons. She, she's hungry. She's hungry. And the kids run by and they're like, they're taking them to the Sept of Baylor. And she's like, who? And they're like the hand of the king. And bells are tolling. Yeah. The crowd is gathering around. They bring that out. They're calling them a traitor. Like they're throwing shit at him. And Arya is watching this from Baylor's statue. And to be honest, in the books, this is almost like this is so sad. Yeah. It it I feel like just Arya's point of view is very sad in the books. But um, so Arya is uh watching as her dad's basically on trial. Mm -hmm. All of this has been planned out. Everyone in the court already knows what's going to happen. They already know that he's going to confess. Joffrey's going to let him take the black and go to the wall. Yorn, yeah. Oh, that's it why, out, right? yeah, that's why Yorn's there. Yorn is waiting for him to take him to the wall. They've already told Yorn to wait for him. So Joffrey just does whatever Joffrey wants <laughs> to do. Well, two things are achieved here, aren't they? Um, the first one is that the audience are now very up to speed on the fact that plot armor doesn't exist. No one is safe, but it also ramps up Joffrey. If there was any doubt, is you know, because before it was like, oh, he's kind of been a bit of a, you know, and then he's been all right. He was kind of, he gave Sansa that necklace and he didn't feel very genuine. But, you know, we weren't 100% sure where Joffrey was going to go. But that that's out the window now. This confirms 100% that Joffrey is a sadistic little, you know Shit. what. Yeah, that's Shit. the one. I'm trying not to swear on your stream. You can say it, Gemma. You can say it. A sadistic little shit. I wanted to say something <laughs> far worse than that. <laughs> But yeah, so when I was watching it for the first time, so I hadn't read the books and I'm watching it, I'm like, there's no way. Yeah. The whole time, right up until they cut his head off, I was like, there's no way. There's no way. Even on the in like when I was waiting for the next episode, I'm like, okay, so they're gonna come back and <laughs> he's gonna they're gonna say he was dreaming or something because this is crazy. But you know, after initial shock, I'm like, oh my god, like they killed Ned Stark because I really, really liked Ned Stark from the beginning, and I always knew that off off the top, <laughs> I already always knew that the Starks were the good people. I, yeah. I, I always knew that. So I always gravitated to them. That and direwolves. I mean, come on. <laughs> but that, when they killed him, like, that turned up TV level for me. Like, there's no other show that compares to Game of Thrones. Who kills off their main character? That was like, the moment they dialed it up to 11, wasn't it? That was it. And, you know... Just going back and looking at it, it seems like Littlefinger may have known that yeah. might happen. Oh, I love you, Grey Area. I am so 100% with you on this. Sorry, carry on. <laughs> yeah, it feels like Littlefinger possibly knew about that. Because when it's happening, if you really watch it, when it's happening, Littlefinger has this sly look on his face. And then... You could see that Cersei and Varys are pleading with Joffrey, like, don't do this. Even Cersei. Even Cersei. Even Cersei did not uh, know. Captain Pycelle, they're all clearly horrified, aren't they? Except yes. Except for Littlefinger. Except Littlefinger. So he just I smirks, doesn't he? You you blink and you miss it, but he smirks. At the, at the moment that Ilin Payne unsheaths ice. You just see Littlefinger with that little wry smirk on his lips. Yep. And look at Littlefinger's face, guys. When when Ned is walking 
up to the Sept of Baylor. Look at his face. He looks like, I know what's about to happen to you. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, I cannot stand him. I cannot stand Littlefinger, but Varys and Cersei and everyone else is pleading like, Joffrey, are you stupid? Like, Pretty much. Yeah. There's no going back from this. Well, and that and that's the thing, isn't it? I mean, as as traumatic and sad and devastating and shocking as it was, actually, it had to happen because Ned's death is the catalyst and the inciting incidents incident for the storyline of his children and how all the other characters. The rest of the story then becomes the the fallout from this moment. Yeah, and another thing I want to touch on, like. It just as the audience, us watching it, it horrifies us. <laughs> Imagine little Arya out there in the crowd, how horrified she is. And Sansa, like I don't, a lot of people think I hate Sansa. <laughs> I changed your mind though, didn't I? Completely. Between, between you, between, look, between <laughs> you and Girls Gone Canon, Chloe and Eliana, and Joe and everybody, like I feel like hating Sans. I don't hate Sans. I just like feel like she's shady and she's capable to do some shady things. Um, Which I don't is a completely valid point of view. I don't think. Uh, I don't want her to die or anything like that. But I will say, like, Sansa fainted. Like, Sansa yeah. had, like, basically begged for mercy for well, her dad. And then this guy... In the books, like, what, what is, is, is actually super, super traumatizing about Sansa in this instance is um, it's an Arya point of view chapter, like you said. And they depicted that on the show. Kind of, We kind of saw it through Arya's eyes, didn't we? So they did a really excellent job of that. But at the moment that the sword swings, and this is in the books, Yarn, in the same way as the show, grabs Arya. So Arya doesn't actually see it. Mm -hmm. But who does see it and who um, is traumatized by this and has this vision repeating over and over in her head for chapters and chapters to come is Sansa. Sansa literally sees the swing and she is utterly uh, and when she um, flashbacks to that moment in her later chapters, it's devastating. Yeah, absolutely horrifying when you think, you know, she's 12, 13 year old girl, um, at least Arya had the mercy of Euron. Yeah. But Sansa wasn't even granted that, was she? Yeah, I will give Sansa that. That is got has to be horrifying. Yeah. Like to see that. And then not only like, okay, yeah, Sansa was dumb for liking Joffrey or whatever, but for your future husband to do that <laughs> is worse than a stranger to do it. Absolutely. Your future husband is ordering this after you've got on your knees in front of the whole court and begged him for mercy. The, the, there was one slight difference. Um, the show gave us um, like, like a glimmer of hope because in the show, Ned sees Arya. She's on the statue, isn't she? And we get that panning in where he's looking for and he can see her and he he had a split second where he was able to pass on where she was to Yoren. so that kind of left ned to die with the passing even if it was only fleeting hope that Yoren would take aria to ensure her safety but the books didn't even give us that no. um and actually the corresponding chapter the current the, the the next aria chapter it, actually leaves us not only with the blow of Ned's death, but with the real possibility that Arya's about to die too, because the last sentence is Yorin pulling out a knife and Arya seeing it flash in front of her eyes. And then it's like end chapter. And it's like, what? It's mm -hmm. it's like George R. R. Martin does not pull any punches. Goodness me. It was traumatizing. And then there was like, just add, let's just add some insult to injury and probably gonna kill Arya too I mean obviously he didn't but he certainly he's just killed Ned Stark so what on earth makes us think at that point finishing that chapter that he wouldn't kill Arya too right Whew. yeah but at least the show were a little bit kinder to us then because it, it was like I said traumatic at best but right before right before they took Ned's head off 
he's like mumbling some words. Yeah. <laughs> so I was trying to figure it out for the longest time. What is he mumbling? Same. Uh, Sean Bean actually said he was mumbling a prayer. Yeah. Just so just random, just because it felt kind of what uh, someone would do when they're yeah. about to get their head cut off. Yeah. Um, I have actually gone through that scene and freeze framed through that scene more than any other scene on a Game of Thrones. <laughs> <laughs> I have I have looked at every single face in that crowd just to see if he had a vision of Lyanna or something. Give me something, anything, but there's there's nothing, absolutely nothing. It is just it, it's it. That's it. That this is his end. And it was that anticlimactic almost yeah but about about uh this episode what what is your overall thoughts on this oh it was wonderful it was absolutely <laughs> wonderful it, in a devastatingly traumatically horrifying way um there was elements of humor there was certainly intrigue i think one of the themes was disillusionment i think there was a lot of disillusioned characters here john was being disillusioned about his choices rob was being disillusioned about being able to fulfill his deal um Tyrion was being disillusioned that a whore could love him and ned was being disillusioned that Joffrey wasn't a little shit. <laughs> right. Um, Disillusionment so yeah, is a good one. Yeah, I think that kind of seemed... And Danny was disillusioned that Drogo was going to be fine. So I think, yeah, I think that was certainly a reoccurring theme. Um, when I read it in the books, it was ter terrible. It was hard. Mm -hmm. And um, watching it again um, on the show, even though I knew it wasn't any easier, not by a long stretch, it was certainly not easier. It was just as hard to watch um it's actually still hard to watch now yeah years later when i go I was, to my rewatches i was dreading it like during this uh rewatch so every time i rewatch i rewatch like before we record to take notes and then i rewatch again just like to make sure i didn't miss anything yeah and when every time when aria catches that pigeon my stomach drops because i know what's That's, next yeah and the, and the bells but yeah it's the pigeon um i was the same um obviously as a book reader when i see her reach for the pigeon because that's the opening to her scene my heart sank yes because i i was like you i knew this is it this is it guys <laughs> this is this it this is happening you know <laughs> that that's yes. kind of where i was mentally so like i said watching it was not easier it was almost worse <laughs> yeah it <laughs> Well, I reading it in the books to me is worse because you get all those inner thoughts and stuff. So, it, especially if it's a character that you really empathize with and you really like and you really, I don't know, I've just always been the black sheep in my family. So I'm like really like feel Arya. Yeah, you're, you're, you've always been a huge Arya fan, haven't you? I, yes. I've warmed to her, I must say. Um, I actually identified with Sansa more, um, but Sansa's certainly not my favourite character by a long stretch. Tyrion's my guy. Tyrion's always been my guy. But yeah, Arya I've definitely warmed to, but like you said, the fact George, I mean, because when Kat dies in the in the Red Wedding, it's from her point of view. She literally dies in her own POV, POV chapter, but Ned doesn't get that. It's not a Ned chapter, it's an Arya chapter, and that just makes it like a million times more. But that Catelyn chapter was crazy, though. <sighs> yeah. Like the end of it, the end of it. Mm. I actually have a sticky note in that book, at uh, that chapter. Don't read this chapter. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's like, like, don't do it, don't do it. Turn it, back. It's Abort brutal. <laughs> it's brutal. I want to thank you for coming on and doing Overwatch with me. Um, I will link all. I'll put all your links in the description box, but still let the people know like what you have coming and up. Oh, thank you. It's been an absolute pleasure. You can find me on Secrets of the Citadel on YouTube and on Instagram under the same name. I'm Gemma Stark on Facebook. Um, there's no point in me telling you my Twitter because Gray will tell you I never go on Twitter. Um, never. 
coming off my channel um i'm going to saturate my channel with book content for as long as i can possibly hold out on the hype that is clearly building for season eight there will reach a point where i am forced to address the show wholeheartedly so i'm really i really feel that i'm feeling the need to get fire and blood and a clash of kings out of my system at the moment as much as possible so that's what you can expect but thank you so much for having me on this has been an absolute pleasure and i can't wait to collect up with you again gray me and Gemma have a collab coming up on Viserion I'll give you a hint a dragon is not a slave but as always thanks for watching if you like this video please give it a thumbs up please click that subscribe button hit that notification bell and join the sweet summer family okay my sweet summer children have a good day